Hello, and welcome to the Hudson Institute's Dialogues on Foreign Policy series. I'm Walter Mead, Senior Fellow at Hudson Institute. It's my pleasure to be joined today by Anthony Tony Blinken, the Chief Foreign Policy Advisor for the Biden for President campaign and former Deputy Secretary of State and Deputy National Secretary, uh, National Security Advisor. During his, camp his career, Mr. Blinken has held a number of distinguished government positions. Um, he was National Security Advisor to, the, to Vice President Biden during the Obama administration. He also served as a Senate Staff Director for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee from 2002 to 2008, and on the National Security Council staff during the Clinton administration. During his time at the State Department, uh, Mr. Blinken played an, an instrumental role in the diplomatic efforts to counter ISIS. He worked on the global refugee crisis and the rebalance to Asia. He's a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times and a global affairs analyst for CNN. And Tony, it's good to see you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great to be with you, Walter. Thanks for having me. Great. And uh, it's, it, I think it's going to be an interesting conversation today. I, I hope we'll be able to follow up at various times. For the format for these conversations, as some of you, some of our regular viewers know, is that we try to give people here a real chance to say what, what's on their mind, really uh, give us some detail about how they see the world, what their priorities are. Uh, this is not about being controversial. Assumption is that the, the viewers are smart enough to figure out whether they agree or, or disagree with what they're hearing. Uh, but also that there are people who want real information about what's going on in the world. And as someone who is an extremely close advisor to the vice president and uh, heads the foreign policy team of the, of the Biden presidential campaign, few people are in a better spot to talk about what a Biden administration foreign policy might look like than Tony Blinken. And as more polls come out and more people start thinking that a Biden administration is not just a possibility, but maybe even a likelihood, obviously the interest in what that policy might look like is going to intensify. So I wonder, uh, maybe the best place to start, Tony, would be for me to ask you to, to take a look at, looking around the world, how would you characterize the main lines of what a Biden foreign policy might look like? Well, you know, Walter, I think first it might help to just take a step back uh, and, and think about uh, the world that uh, if Biden's elected, Vice President Biden's elected, we would be inheriting. And that goes a long way uh, to telling you uh, the direction of the foreign policy we pursue uh, in office. And I think it's um, uh, no less important for being evident that we're living in a time of shifting uh, power and alignments uh, among nations. Uh, a huge diffusion of power away from states, um, and a growing questioning of governance within states. Um, tremendous economic, uh, demographic, technological, environmental, geopolitical change that we're all experiencing every day. And in fact, the rapidity and pace of change is such that I think uh, there's a general sense that we've lost uh, our, our North Star. People uh, are increasingly confused. They feel a sense of chaos. Um, they don't know uh, which end is up. And I think as a consequence of that, uh, as well as um, a tremendous uh, inequality problem, both within our own country and, and around the world, um, we are facing, I think, the most challenging and complex international uh, landscape and international security landscape, um, certainly in decades, um, if, uh, if not longer. Having said that, um, I think uh, the Vice President certainly believes it's within uh, our considerable capacity, America's considerable capacity, to uh, shape things, at least on the margins, uh, for, um, for a better future where our security, our prosperity, our, our values are enhanced, um, not diminished. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the big picture that we're, uh, you know, that we're facing. Um, even in all of this change, I, I think there are certain constants, and, and let me just briefly mention those, then we can get into more, um, more specifics. Um, first, whether we like it or not, uh, the world tends not to organize itself. So there is a premium still, and in some ways even more than before, on American engagement, on American leadership, because basically we have a choice. If we're not doing 
uh, a lot of that organizing uh, in terms of shaping the rules and the norms and the institutions through which uh, countries relate to one another, then one of two things. Um, either someone else is doing it, um, and probably not in a way that advances our own interests and values, uh, or maybe just as bad, no one is. And then you tend to have chaos and a vacuum that may be filled by bad things before it's filled by good things. So there's a premium, I think the vice president believes, on American engagement, on American leadership. Second, and again, no less important for being obvious, there's also a premium on finding ways and probably new ways to cooperate among nations and among uh, different stakeholders. Because simply put, the big problems that we face uh, as a country uh, and as a, uh, as a planet, whether it's climate change, whether it's a pandemic, uh, whether it's the spread of, uh, of bad weapons, to state the obvious, uh, none of these have unilateral solutions. Uh, even a country as powerful as the United States can't handle them alone. Uh, there's no wall high enough or thick enough uh, to ward them off. So we have to figure out ways to uh, cooperate more effectively, taking into account the fact that there are now all sorts of groups and individuals empowered by technology and information that have greater veto authority than ever before on the decisions of traditional sources of uh, authority and decision making, like a national government or an international organization. Um, add to that a crisis in the credibility of um, institutions. Um, hyperpartisanship, uh, corruption permeating uh, our systems in different ways, it makes for an incredibly challenging time. Um, so <laughs> that's the, um, that's kind of the big envelope in which um, I think uh, a new administration will have to engage. No, I think that's, that's right. Maybe, maybe what we should do is talk about a few hot spots and then get back to these sort of overarching issues if that sure. works. Sure. And I think the first thing that would be on a lot of people's mind would be the U.S.-China relationship, uh, where in some ways, oddly, even though you, the U.S. political climate has become very polarized, we've seen uh, you know, a continuation. The Obama administration began a rebalance toward Asia, and, and today you hear from many Democrats as well as many Republicans a concern about what's going on in China and the future of the relationship. So how do you how do you see a an, a Biden administration getting sort of setting itself up to deal with China? Well, first of all, I think you're right. There is um, uh, a growing uh, consensus across parties uh, that China poses uh, a series of, uh, of new challenges um, and that the status quo uh, was really not sustainable, particularly when it uh, when it comes to China's uh, commercial and economic practices. The the lack of reciprocity in the relationships uh, were something that couldn't be sustained and needed to be uh, and continued to need to be dealt with. But here's the problem. And again, take take a step back. My concern now is that in terms of China's strategic interests and in terms of our own, uh, China, as a result of the last three and a half years, is in a stronger position. And we're in a weaker position. And that's what a Biden administration would have to start to rebuild from. So what do, what do I mean by that? Um, if, you, if you think about what China would hope to achieve, achieve strategically uh, around the world, um, unfortunately, in my judgment, uh, the Trump administration has helped them advance uh, their interests. Um, weaker U.S. alliances. China sees alliances as a core source of strength for the United States, something they don't share and enjoy. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the way Trump is, President Trump has pursued his policies, uh, that's weakened, not strengthened, our core alliances, particularly in Asia. Uh, institutions. China is trying to assert its own leadership in international institutions at the expense of our own. Well, our own withdrawal from virtually every institution you can think of has left an opening for China to fill. Um, when it comes to uh, values, our abdication uh, of standing up for our own values and uh, in uh, in Asia uh, and with regard to China's actions has, I think, given the government in Beijing a sense of greater impunity when it comes to cracking down on democracy in Hong Kong or, for that matter, uh, dealing uh, and abusing the human rights of Uyghurs uh, in China. And finally, our own democracy, um, when it is weak, when it looks like it's in disarray, when it seems not to be delivering from for its people, when people are questioning um, it's, uh, it's legitimacy that is uh, arguably good for China uh, because 
our model looks less attractive than it otherwise would? Well, I think President Trump, unfortunately, has led an assault on our own democracy, its institutions, its values, its people, uh, that has served to further delegitimize it, uh, not just in the eyes of, uh, of, of Americans, but uh, around the world. So in that sense, I'm afraid, we're at a strategic disadvantage, China's at a strategic advantage at this particular moment. So having said that, how would we approach things? Um, a few things that are, that are worth underscoring. First, um, it's vital because we are in a competition with China, and there's nothing wrong with competition if it's fair. Um, in fact, it hopefully brings out uh, in some ways the best. Um, we need in the first instance to invest in our own competitiveness. Um, and that means making some very fundamental uh, reorientations of resources and priorities when it comes to investing in American infrastructure, American education, the healthcare system, our workers, and their competitiveness. Second, um, one of the things I think that's been a deficiency in the Trump administration's approach to contending with China is it's done so not with our allies and partners, but without them, indeed, by, uh, while alienating them. Um, we need to rally our allies and partners instead of alienating them to deal with some of the challenges that China poses. For example, on trade, as you know, Walter, we're about 25% of world GDP alone. When we're working with allies and partners, depending on who we, we, we bring into the mix, it's 50 or 60% of GDP. That's a lot more weight and a lot harder for China to ignore. Uh, third, we need to be standing up for our values and put them back at the center of our foreign policy, not walk away from them. We obviously need to be in a place to effectively deter aggression uh, if China uh, pursues it. And finally, I think you'd see a Biden administration having reestablished our relative strength in the relationship, then be able to uh, engage China and work with China in areas where our interests clearly overlap, whether it is, again, contending with climate change, dealing with um, global health and pandemics, uh, dealing with the spread of, of dangerous weapons. We're much better off, though, uh, finding ways to cooperate when we're acting from a position of strength than from a position of weakness. Okay. Um, I hear what you're saying. I, I... On, on the question of sort of values and democracy, I haven't been to Asia in the last couple few months, obviously, but I spent some time there uh, last year. And I was hearing from a number of people in a number of countries that democracy promotion is not as po popular among a lot of our potential Asian allies as say it was in Europe during the Cold War. So, you know, if we want Thailand and Burma and Vietnam and a number of other countries to, to work with us, and even India to a certain extent, which is a democracy, but has a somewhat different view of, of what that might mean than we do, um, as kind of the ideological component while providing definitely certain advantages, or I could add for the Philippines, Mm. Also, also complicates the task of alliance building and, and management in Asia. How would you respond to that? So, you know, a, a couple of things. Um, first, this is not about some uh, crusade um, about um, you know uh, building a uh, at the force of the at the point of a bayonet building a, a world of democracies. But I think we have to start from uh, at least as I would see it a basic uh, premise, which is. When we're thinking about, uh, and then I'll, I'll get to the Asia piece um, more specifically, but look, if, if, if Joe Biden's elected president, uh, he's going to inherit two things, um, a divided country and a world increasingly in disarray. And he would argue, I think, that the best answer, the best initial foundational answer to those challenges is in fact democracy, because it is, when it's functioning, the foundation of our strength at home, but also uh, abroad. Um, it, uh, it should reflect uh, uh, who we are. Certainly, it's how we've seen ourselves. And at least until recently, it's also, I think, how the world um, tends to see us. But that democracy is obviously under challenge uh, in ways that arguably it hasn't been before. And uh, that matters um, as a foundation for our foreign policy. First, when you think about it, the strength of our democracy at home is directly tied to our ability to be a force uh, for progress, uh, to mobilize collective action around the world. Uh, and here again, my concern is that we've seen a daily assault on democracy uh, under this administration, which has tarnished our own ability uh, to lead. 
um, as Joe Biden likes to say, uh, we get a lot of mileage out of leading by the power of our example, not just the example uh, of our power. And then abroad, other democracies tend to be a source of strength for us if we're acting together. But here again, we've got a problem. Um, as you know very well, uh, we've seen a retreat uh, when it comes to democracy uh, over the last decade or so. Um, Freedom House, which tracks this stuff uh, and ranks countries, um, of the 40 or so countries ranked free in the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s, fully half, I think, have fallen backwards on their metrics. And there is what people call a democratic uh, recession. Uh, autocracies from Russia to, to China are trying to, um, to exploit that, to add fuel to our own uh, troubles. And so at the very moment that democracies most need uh, leadership, and I would argue leadership from the United States playing the role that it's played before as the, the leader of the free world, Unfortunately, we have a president who, by embracing autocrats and, and dismissing Democrats, seems um, to many to have suited up for the other side. So it's a long way of saying that if we renew our democracy at home, uh, if we revitalize our alliances with democracies in the first instance around the world, that creates a foundation for us to act, I, I believe, more effectively in dealing with lots of challenges. Now, I don't think it's one size fits all. And uh, there, are, there, are, there are countries that we need to work with clearly, um, including in Asia, that may not fit uh, the uh, Jeffersonian democracy ideal uh, that we may have. Obviously, we don't either at this point. Um, but uh, when you shore up your democratic base, when you get democracies working uh, together, um, that creates a foundation in which, uh, upon which to bring in others on different issues. Um, when it comes to uh, Asia, uh, in, you know, in particular, um, look, I think we, we did uh, the rebalance uh, under the uh, Obama-Biden administration, and it was an effective vehicle, um, I think, for redirecting our, our time, our energy, and resources to uh, a part of the world that arguably uh, matters more than any other uh, to our future. Um, but that entailed working with countries that certainly were not uh, fully democratic, uh, under the um, measures you and I would uh, would consider. Uh, we obviously need to pursue that. And hopefully, as our model becomes once again attractive and effective at dealing with problems and helping people advance in their own lives, then uh, you'll have an incentive for countries to continue to democratize themselves. Okay. Uh, well, let's, let's jump from Asia to the Middle East. And here, I, I, I guess I'd start by asking, you know, there's been some discussion that maybe the Middle East doesn't matter as much to the United States now as it did at a time, say, when we were importing oil and oil was the kind of seen as the key to, to everything around the world. Has the place, and, and then the rise of China, has the place of the Middle East written large changed in American foreign policy? Well, I think uh, in short, Yes, um, it, it has. And again, uh, as we're looking at things already in the uh, in the Obama Biden administration with um, the, the, the so-called pivot to Asia or the rebalance to Asia, that was simply a recognition of um, what we saw as the, as the facts that when we considered where our interests uh, were uh, most acute, where uh, the future uh, seemed most um, uh, to be emerging. Uh, for the United States in terms of uh, our interests, we were um, under-resourced in Asia and arguably over-resourced in, uh, in other areas. Um, and I think that remains the case. Um, presumably, in uh, a Biden administration, we would see more emphasis on the Indo-Pacific, uh, more emphasis on our own hemisphere, um, as well as some sustained engagement, uh, I would hope, with, uh, with Africa. And obviously, Europe remains a partner of first resort not last resort when it comes to contending with the challenges we face. So just as a matter of uh, time allocation, budget priorities, uh, I think we would be doing less, not more uh, in the Middle East. Having said that, there are obviously certain fundamentals that remain, uh, that remain constant, uh, including uh, starting with even our um, relationship with, uh, with Israel uh, as the anchor and foundation for democracy uh, in the region. That won't change. Uh, the commitment to Israel's security, uh, 
uh, is not going away. Um, but overall, in terms of the uh, amount of time and focus and energy and resources, uh, we need to be thinking about um, how we uh, allocate them to best match our interests. And again, I think that suggests uh, more in the Asia Pacific, uh, more in our own hemisphere uh, and the sustained engagement in Europe. Um, and you've talked about uh, if the um, uh, if, if Iran were to return to full compliance with the JCPOA, the U.S. would re-enter under a Biden administration and then take it from there. How what what might that look like? Well, here again, we have a I think we have a um, a problem that um, President Trump has turned into. Um, a much uh, a much bigger one, a much deeper one, and and potentially uh, into a crisis. Um, the president did two things. He tore up the uh, the JCPOA, the nuclear agreement with Iran, um, and he said it would lead to uh, and compel Iran to negotiate a better uh, agreement. And he also um, instituted a campaign of so-called maximum pressure that he said would uh, curb Iran's provocative actions. Uh, in the region. Um, in fact, exactly the opposite has happened, as many predicted uh, at the time. Um, far from leading to a better agreement, uh, the unraveling of the JCPOA because of the actions of the Trump administration has now put us in a place where, one, uh, we're isolated from our partners who negotiated the agreement with us, and two, uh, and much more importantly even, um, Iran is um, restarting dangerous components of this program and putting itself in a position where it is closer to uh, a uh, the capacity to develop fissile material for a nuclear weapon on short order than it was uh, when um, when we left office. Um, and so there is no, as far as I can tell, uh, no strategy, no plan on the part of this administration to do anything about this. So we're heading right back to where we were before the agreement, which is a really terrible binary choice between either taking action uh, to stop the program with all of the uh, potential unintended consequences uh, of doing that or doing nothing and allowing uh, Iran to be um, in a breakout position where it can develop a nuclear weapon on very, very short order. Um, and then in terms of its uh, uh, provocative actions, um, this strange schizophrenic seesawing back and forth on the part of the administration in terms of not responding to things Iran was doing, for example, the attack on the um, uh, pipelines in Saudi Arabia, to uh, then uh, taking out Qasem Soleimani, for whom no one is shedding a tear. This schizophrenic back and forth led to a sort of tit-for-tat rationing up uh, of tensions, uh, including uh, missile attacks on uh, our bases in Iraq uh, that, did, that, that harmed uh, more than 100 Americans, uh, brought us to potentially the brink of conflict. Um, and uh, again, uh, we've seen Iran take more provocative actions in the region, not less. So uh, the Trump administration strategy has backfired uh, in a massive way. Um, the most uh, fundamental challenge for us and problem for us in terms of our own interests is in the first instance dealing with Iran's nuclear program. That's what the JCPOA was about. Um, and so if Iran comes back into compliance with its obligations, uh, Joe Biden said we should too uh, and we would too. Uh, and then having brought the allies back on our side, uh, now they keep asserting an equivalence between Iran and the United States, pretty extraordinary, asking us both to calm down. Um, with our partners and allies back on our side, with the agreement once again uh, in force, we can use that as a platform to try to build a stronger and longer uh, agreement. And with the allies with us again, um, we're in a much better position uh, jointly to confront Iran's actions and provocations uh, that we don't like. Uh, right now, most of our partners are spending all of their time trying to figure out how to keep the nuclear agreement alive, not working with us to deal with Iran's excesses in the region. Let me uh, uh, just quickly on the Israel question. If Israel goes ahead with annexations on the West Bank uh, in the next few months, does that complicate the Israel relationship with the Biden administration? Well, here's what it does. Um, it certainly complicates even more than it already is the prospect of uh, achieving a two-state solution in the Middle East. And that outcome, two states for two people, 
in, in, in my judgment and the vice president's judgment, more importantly, represents the best way and probably the only way that um, you'll have a secure uh, future for Israel as a Jewish and democratic state and a state for the Palestinians. And so any unilateral action by either side that makes that prospect even more difficult and more distant is something that um, uh, the vice president opposes and would oppose uh, as president. So we'll see what uh, what Israel chooses to do. Uh, but ideally, obviously, it won't pursue it. And uh, we will find ways to rebuild an environment in which it's possible for the parties to re-engage uh, in the direction of two states. Well, now I want to shift a bit toward Europe. And maybe the way to do that is to look at Turkey for a moment, which is a NATO ally and, and a European country in some ways, but is increasing a Middle Eastern actor as well. Uh, where do you see the relationship with Turkey going and what, do you, what would a Biden administration be looking for there? Look, it's in, an, it's in a very, very challenging uh, place. Uh, as you said, uh, Turkey is a NATO uh, ally by its engagements, by its geographical uh, position um, uh, by its interests. Um, it's a vitally uh, important country and it winds up being um, in one way or another and often in a central way um, critical to uh, some uh, issue, conflict, uh, initiative. So uh, we obviously want to find uh, a way to have a more productive um, and positive relationship with Turkey, but uh, that requires uh, the Turkish government itself uh, to want uh, uh, to want the same thing. Um, we obviously have uh, some real uh, issues and differences, but we also have uh, areas where it would make good sense for us to find ways to work more effectively uh, together. Um, Syria, for example, being uh, uh, being one of them. So I would hope that um, we can find ways to uh, uh, to do that, but I don't want to um, underestimate some of the challenges that uh, uh, that we're facing um, in the relationship. Um, and that's going to require, I think, first and foremost, some very um, uh, direct and, and, and clear talk. I, w I will say uh, the vice president has a, uh, a long relationship um, with um, President Erdogan. Uh, they've known each other. They've engaged uh, directly on a lot of things. And I think we found in, engage in working with Turkey that that relationship is obviously the most important one. So uh, I suspect you'd see some significant engagement on the part of the uh, of a President Biden uh, with his Turkish counterpart to see if we can work through uh, the host of issues that we need to find ways to tackle together. Well, this sort of gets me to a, sort of a Europe-NATO question, because as we look at the situation in Libya now, we can see that sort of France has lined up with Russia and Egypt and the UAE and some others in Libya, uh, Italy, and, you know, is kind of quietly supporting Turkey in a way. They're, they're interested in the line. Um, so in, in that sense, in, in, in here in the Mediterranean, an area of vital interest to the EU and of real importance to NATO, we don't have a coordinated EU policy really in Libya. We don't have anything that looks like a coordinated NATO policy in Libya. And I, I just raise this as an example of some of the kinds of issues it seems to me we're looking at transatlantically now that it's, you know, we, it's not just is Germany paying enough money for its, uh, its defense or is the United States, you know, being engaged enough in certain ways, but there's a kind of divergence of interests and a, and a failure to, in many countries to align policies with these alliance structures and international structures. How does a Biden administration sort of work on that? Well, in the first instance, uh, showing up again and demonstrating that you actually support these institutions and uh, see them as important vehicles for advancing shared interests. When we walk away from them, when we spend most of our time uh, taking a two by four to them, it's not really a surprise that uh, they don't prove to be effective uh, vehicles for dealing uh, with really, really hard problems. So I think revaluing uh, these um, alliances, starting with NATO, 
uh, is going to be very, very important to a, a Biden administration. Uh, similarly with the EU, um, President Trump has treated it as an adversary when, in fact, uh, it can and should be a vital partner for the United States, again, in dealing with very difficult, challenging situations like Libya. Uh, so that's the that's really the first step. It's actually revitalizing these alliances, revitalizing these partnerships, reasserting uh, that America values them and that we want to be engaged in them or with them uh, to work together to tackle um, these hard problems. Um, <laughs> Libya is a particularly um, uh, challenging one, and I have to you know acknowledge that um, uh, we obviously did not uh, succeed in the um, Obama Biden administration in getting that right. In part, uh, I think one of the things that we um, hadn't seen uh, as clearly as we should have, arguably, is that Gaddafi had done uh, a brilliant job making sure that there was nothing that could that could rise to challenge his power over the years, and so there was, in effect, uh, virtually no functioning bureaucracy or administrative state with which to partner uh, after he was uh, he was gone from the scene. That made it very difficult to get anything done. There was also, despite the fact the country is divided in so many ways, also a, a hard core of nationalism that made it very, very difficult uh, to get Libyans to accept any kind of international security force that arguably might have helped stabilize the situation uh, after Gaddafi, or even uh, training for their own security forces. And now, of course, uh, in the intervening time, uh, we've had vacuums, and those vacuums, as I said earlier, have been filled by, by bad things, not good things. Uh, and we have um, Libya as a sort of uh, terrain of a, pro for a proxy contest for, uh, for other powers that you um, uh, listed so well. Uh, so that's going to be very, very hard to untangle. But again, Walter, I think it starts with actually um, valuing and using the institutions that allow us to cooperate and collaborate and find joint approaches to hard problems. Okay. Uh, just quickly, because I, I do want to move on to some of the global issues, uh, there's always Russia, which seems to be looming over American politics. And I know every American president, at least since George W. Bush, has been sure that they, they could figure out a way to work with Putin. And so far, I'd say we are 0 for 3 in that, in that department. Um, what's, what would uh, President Biden try to do there? You know, it's interesting, because if you... Remember back, uh, the very first foreign policy speech of the uh, Obama Biden administration was one uh, that the vice president delivered at the Munich Security Conference in February of 2009. And that was the um, what was then called the, the reset speech in terms of the relationship between the United States and Russia. And indeed, uh, we talked about resetting the relationship. Uh, at that point, it had reached what seemed to be uh, a, a low point. And we thought there were areas where we could more effectively uh, work together because it was in our in our uh, mutual interest. Um, and indeed, uh, we wound up doing that when it comes to uh, uh, New START. Uh, we were uh, the champion for getting Russia into the WTO. Uh, we worked together uh, even in Afghanistan at that point in time. Things have really changed. Um, and so that that speech tried to create a foundation for the reset. But there was another part to that speech that people didn't pick up on as much at the time, in which the vice president said, even as we seek to reset relations with Russia, we are not going to compromise on certain core values. Um, among them, the conviction that uh, this is no longer a, a world of spheres of influence and we will not uh, accept them. It's not a world in which one country can um, tell its uh, neighbors um, with whom they can associate or not associate or what their policy should or shouldn't be. Uh, it's not a world in which uh, one country should be able to violate the sovereign uh, borders of another uh, by exerting uh, its, uh, its greater strength. And unfortunately, the way things have unfolded, um, we've seen that second part uh, of the speech come to, um, uh, come to life. Uh, here again, we've had, I think, maybe this, the, the, the strangest and still unexplained chapter of the Trump administration is President Trump's uh, relationship to, to Mr. Putin and to, uh, and to Russia. Um, and even as elements of his administration have sought to take um, an appropriately tough line on Russia for uh, the things that, it's, that, that it does, President Trump repeatedly um, undermines that effort. Uh, and of course, famously, 
he denies that uh, Russia interfered in our 2016 election and is trying to do it uh, once again. And he took the word of Mr. Putin over our own intelligence community. So again, you've got to start with recognizing the problem and recognizing the challenge. Um, and, you know, it's funny, I was just reading um, a piece uh, before we got on the, um, uh, the video conference that um, uh, my friend Dove Zakheim wrote in which he uh, quotes from George Kennan's Long Cable. And um, I just printed it because it's so remarkably uh, compelling and remarkably, remarkably of the of the moment. Uh, so this is um, this is Ken in what, 70 some odd years ago. Um, and let me just read it because it's it's remarkably uh, on point. Um, at, at bottom of the Kremlin's neurotic view of world affairs is traditional and instinctive Ru Russian sense of insecurity. Russia's rulers have invariably sensed that their rule was re relatively archaic in form. Originally, this was insecurity of a peaceful agricultural people trying to live on, vast exposed, on a vast exposed plain in a neighborhood of fierce nomadic peoples. To this was added, as Russia came into contact with the economically advanced West, fears of more competent, more powerful, more highly organized societies. For this reason, Russia's rulers have always feared foreign penetration. Russians will participate officially in international organizations where they see opportunity for extending their power or inhibiting or diluting the power of others. Efforts will be made to disrupt Western national self-confidence, to hamstring measures of national defense, to increase social and industrial unrest, to stimulate all forms of disunity. Poor will be set against rich, black against white, young against old, newcomers against established residents. Wow. That sure sounds familiar. And so I think recognizing that strain in uh, Russia's policies that predate Mr. Putin and presumably will follow him uh, needs to be um, front and center uh, in our thinking. Um, again, uh, my own take is when you're able to approach countries that with whom we're in an adversarial position on a number of issues, from a position of strength, that also much better enables you to find areas of cooperation if it happens to be in your self-interest. And so, for example, strategic arms limitation is something we should continue to pursue uh, with Russia. Uh, but we're best off doing it when we have our eyes wide open, not as they've been for the last three and a half years, firmly shut. I, well, I agree. And I love the quote from uh, from Cannon there. I remember uh, I, I wrote some years ago that uh, I lost a lot of faith in the American intellectual foreign policy class because at the end of the Cold War, everybody said, oh, that Putin, is, I'm sorry, that Kennan is such a genius. He <laughs> saw this 40 years ago and it finally worked. But then they simultaneously said, and now that Russia is not communist, we can be friends and it's all going to be great. And in fact, the whole point of, of, of Kennan is, was that the problem here is not that they're communists, but that they're Russian. Is the, is the thing that we really have to come to grips with. And I have to say it's also very discouraging for a writer on foreign affairs to realize that the most profound essay maybe in, in the 20th century in America could be so universally misunderstood and misapplied. You wonder sometimes why you get up in the morning. Well, uh, some things are truly evergreen and this really is, um, uh, is one of them. And um, that's why and I'm, I'm glad I, I just happened to see this uh, this op-ed by by, by Dovin and, and this just jumped out. And it's um, that's why I like to go back and read Gaddis every once in a while, et cetera. Oh, it's, it's good stuff. Um, well, I want to move to global issues here um, and maybe a sort of a jumping uh, sort of, again, a halfway house is to think about Latin America and the hemisphere for a moment. Yeah. Because I do think the next administration is whoever that is is going to face uh, um, deep issues in the hemisphere, and those are often very divisive in terms of American politics as well. But you can look from Brazil to Mexico just to take that group, um, and there are significant issues in just a large number of countries, ranging from sort of political polarization of the climate, maybe we see here to uh, sort of a broader social breakdown, a breakdown of law and order in places, and then the, the Venezuelan sort of imploding black hole. Um, it's a mess. So how does, how does a new administration wrap its head around this and try to 
we, we can't ignore it. How does one play a constructive role? Yeah, we, 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 we certainly can't ignore it. And on the contrary, uh, we have a profound interest um, in engaging it. And on the upside, if uh, we can get to a place where uh, we have a hemisphere of functioning democracies, uh, growing economies uh, that respect uh, uh, human rights, um, that is profoundly in the interests of uh, the United States, obviously the interests of the countries themselves um, and the world. But uh, as you say very well, there are huge challenges. But let's just take one um, that's actually directly confronts us, and that is the migration challenge from the Northern Triangle countries, uh, Guatemala, Honduras, Salvador. Um, obviously, the problems in those countries when it comes to um, crime and uh, gang violence, uh, drugs, lack of economic opportunity, um, among other things, are huge drivers. And, you know, the idea that someone wakes up in the morning and says, gee, wouldn't it be great fun today to give up everything I know, um, where I live, my family, my friends, um, my comfort, uh, and go to some place that may not want me, uh, where I may not even know the language or, or, um, uh, or have family or friends. Um, wouldn't that be a great thing to do? Uh, people who undertake these journeys have usually, usually, usually compelling drivers that, um, that push them in that direction. Parenthetically, um, they tend to be uh, a source of tremendous strength for our country because it takes extraordinary courage, dynamism, energy uh, to give up everything, to put your life in jeopardy, uh, to try to find a better life somewhere else. But we obviously have a, a, a stake in, in helping countries find ways to make uh, themselves more attractive so that uh, more people don't feel compelled uh, to make that kind of journey. So it's interesting when, when Biden, uh, Joe Biden was vice president, you know, we talk about not being able to get anything done in Washington and, and the, uh, the partisan divide. He actually secured bipartisan support uh, for um, an almost a billion dollars in aid for El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, but backed up by concrete commitments uh, from those countries to take on corruption, to take on violence, to, to end, uh, to take on uh, endemic poverty that were driving people to leave their homes. And um, some uh, big chunks of this money were actually sent through uh, independent organizations so that they didn't go into a government black hole. And we started to see um, security improve. We started to see migration flows uh, decrease, uh, for example, in, uh, from Salvador. Um, and that was, a, I think, a, a smart approach, not throwing uh, money away, but tying it to concrete commitments that were in the interests of both, both sides. We have a plan, uh, the vice president has a plan to build significantly on that initiative uh, over four years with basically a $4 billion regional strategy that would require countries to contribute their own resources, their own commitments, to undertake concrete reforms that make them more attractive uh, places for their own people. That's the kind of thing that's both uh, smart and potentially uh, effective and it's clearly in our interest. Okay. Um, I hear we'll, we'll now go into the sort of overarching global issues. And I think maybe one of the biggest differences in the two uh, candidates this fall is going to be over in the environment. Mm -hmm. both over the, the, the dangers of climate change and over the sort of strategies for coping with it or dealing with it. Um, how, and, and it's a huge issue that obviously bleeds into almost every facet of foreign policy. So I'd be very interested to hear how the Biden camp is thinking of this. Well, quite simply, it is uh, arguably the one truly existential issue uh, that we face. Um, and it has to be and under a Biden administration would be um, a number one priority. Um, he's put out a detailed plan uh, for what he would do in terms of the very significant um, and urgent investments at home uh, to put us on track to have uh, a clean energy economy with net zero emissions by 2050. Um, but let's just think briefly about the international piece. Um, that's equally important because we're what, 15% of global emissions. By definition, even if we do everything just right, 
at home, that doesn't solve the problem if the rest of the world is 85% of global emissions. The benefit of getting uh, things right at home is uh, we can then leverage uh, our economic and moral authority to push the world to take more determined uh, action. So um, the vice president thinks it's uh, critical and said that on day one of his administration, he would rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, then, uh, as a priority, um, in the first, uh, certainly in the first year of his administration, convene a summit of um, the world's major carbon emitters uh, to rally countries, not just on, on sticking with Paris, but to actually raise their ambitions and try to push progress further and, and faster. Um, we'd also look to do a number of other things. Uh, for example, locking in enforceable commitments to reduce emissions in global shipping and aviation, um, pursuing stronger measures to make sure that other nations can't undercut the United States economically as we meet our own commitments. One of that, one, for example, would involve uh, working uh, to insist that China, which is the world's largest emitter of carbon, stop subsidizing coal exports and outsourcing pollution to other countries uh, by financing billions of dollars worth of dirty you know, fossil fuel energy projects through the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. So that's the kind of approach uh, that we would take. But again, it does start at home because if we're not doing what we need to do, it's a heck of a lot harder to convince the rest of the world to do what it needs to do. Uh, trade. You've mentioned trade before. Uh, the Biden administration tried to strengthen the WTO, go back to the TPP. What? Uh, where do you see that headed? I think again, we, Walter. I would start with, you know, a couple of basic premises. One of which is that, you know, we are, um, uh, what um, about five percent of the world's population. So. Uh, if we want to reach the other 95%, if we want to be able to sell our products and our services and our ingenuity, uh, we've got to be able to reach them. And so as a basic principle, uh, trade is profoundly in the interests of the United States. If we're going to sustain our growth, if we're going to uh, advance our growth, if we're going to sustain and advance our standard of living, uh, we have to find ways to continue uh, to uh, open markets and to make sure that American products, American services, uh, American ideas uh, can be consumed uh, around the world. Um, second basic premise uh, is that, you know, and it goes back to something we were talking about at the very beginning, uh, we have a choice to make. If we're not engaged uh, in these efforts, then someone else is likely to be in our place. And so it makes a big difference to the United States if we are helping to shape the rules that govern trade, the norms that govern trade, the institutions that govern trade, and make sure that uh, they're in a race to the top, not the bottom, when it comes, for example, to uh, protecting the rights of labor, protecting the environment, transparency, et cetera. Having said that, um, I think we clearly uh, need to and would do things differently going forward. Um, first, the guiding principle and the prism through which uh, a President Biden would look at uh, a trade is, is what we are doing in the interest of American workers. Uh, everything we, we do has to be grounded in the proposition that we are going to fight like heck for uh, American workers. Second, if we want to be effective in, in, um, uh, in trade and in competition, have we invested in our own competitiveness? Um, have we put the resources uh, and the time and effort into building our educational capacity, our infrastructure, our healthcare system, and of course, into workers themselves? And then are the benefits that accrue uh, just going uh, to corporations uh, in ways that allow them to just buy back their stock, uh, pay more dividends and boost the salaries of their CEOs, or are they actually being invested in, uh, in workers? And then as we're negotiating, um, it's vitally important that we have all of the interests affected by uh, a trade agreement at the table at the start, not just receiving the final product at the end. So trade uh, leaders, uh, uh, labor leaders, excuse me, environmental leaders, um, as well as other groups that are affected, other interests that are affected, they need to be in on this from the takeoff, not just the landing, because otherwise, whatever is negotiated is probably not gonna be politically sustainable. We were talking earlier about how 
information and technology has given all sorts of new actors the ability to, to have veto power over uh, decisions, agreements arrived at by national governments or international institutions. Well, if they're not in on things from the takeoff, uh, they're likely to use that veto power on the landing. Uh, I, mean, I think you make some, some very good points there. I'm, I'm thinking, though, about, say, a country like India, and where probably the environmental and labor standards that we might want or some American civil groups might want in a trade agreement are going to be are going to be disturbing where the environmental probably you know a strongly green u.s administration is likely to be asking india to do a fairly long list of things it doesn't want to do necessarily at least spontaneously leap to want to do uh, and in the same way on maybe some human rights and democracy issues particularly with respect to muslims in india and kashmir and elsewhere and yet at the same time, it's hard to imagine a, an effective policy vis-a-vis -vis China that doesn't include very strong U.S.-India links. So I guess my question is, how does, again, I, I, you can't possibly give a detailed exposition of, of India policy, but, but how do we think about these things together? Because it seems to me they do, they do really matter. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Walter, with the premise of your uh, uh, of your question, and I think from from Vice President Biden's perspective, strengthening and deepening the relationship with India uh, is going to be a very high priority. Um, it's usually important to the future of the Indo-Pacific uh, and and the kind of order that we all want. It's fair, stable, and uh, hopefully increasingly democratic, um, and it's vital to being able to tackle some of these big global challenges. So we, and by the way, I think this has been over Republican and Democratic administrations, a success story going back to um, the Clinton administration, uh, the Bush administration, and then the Obama Biden administration. Um, during the Bush administration, uh, then Senator Biden partnered with uh, that administration to help get the uh, peaceful nuclear cooperation agreement, the one, two, three agreement through the United States Senate, usually important to solidifying um, our relationship. In our own administration, um, you know, during the Obama uh, Biden administration, uh, there was concrete progress across a whole series uh, of uh, initiatives and efforts under both Prime Minister Singh and then um, under Prime Minister Modi. There was this um, uh, defense technology and trade initiative. The idea there was to kind of strengthen um, India's industrial uh, defense industrial base, and that then paved the way for American and Indian companies to work together to produce um, important technology. We um, we made India a major, a so-called major defense partner. That was something that we got the Congress to approve, and that was unique uh, to India. And what that did is it basically ensured that when it it, it comes to advanced sensitive technology uh, that India needs to strengthen its military it's treated on par with our allies and, and, and partners. So having sort of set that foundation um, and, and made the relationship stronger, guess what? We then worked hard to persuade India that it would be more prosperous and more secure if it signed on to the Paris Climate Agreement. And we succeeded. It wasn't easy. It was for the, all the reasons that you cited. Uh, it was a challenging effort, but Vice President Biden was one of the leaders of the effort to convince our partners in India, uh, and they did. And I think that's a, you know, a reflection, again, of the fact that we cannot solve common global challenges uh, without India as part of uh, the deal. Um, and so, you know, across the board, we were working hard not just to advance clean energy, uh, but to do a whole series of things, public health cooperation, space exploration, um, humanitarian relief operations. All of these things were part and parcel of the relationship, and all of them went to, to strengthening it. Now, you're right. We obviously have challenges now uh, and real concerns, for example, uh, about some of the actions that uh, the government has taken, particularly in cracking down on freedom of movement and, and, and freedom of speech in, in Kashmir, um, some of the laws on citizenship. Um, uh, but you're always better engaging with uh, a partner um, and, a, and a vitally important one like India when you can speak frankly and directly about areas where you have differences, even as you're working to build uh, greater uh, cooperation and, uh, and strengthen the relationship 
going forward. So that would be the uh, the approach. And again, I think we we've seen evidence that it uh, that it works. All right. Well, I think we've we've covered a lot of ground. We have not covered all the ground. Uh, the world. I, think I can persuade you to come back sometime, and we can we can take another uh, bite at the apple here. But uh, I really appreciate your 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 sharing the time and uh, look forward to a very very interesting debate during the presidential season. Great. Thanks, Walter. Really enjoyed the conversation, and I welcome uh, an opportunity to pursue it. Thanks. All right. Great. Thank you, Tom. Take care.